decide to follow Jesus, one thing is absolutely certain. We are up for some of the greatest adventures that a living being can have. And um, as a believer in Jesus Christ, there's times when we see God's bountiful hand of provision and blessing. Has anyone had that happen recently where just something out of the ordinary comes and you're like, wow, this is so incredible. Maybe some of you have. There is supernatural things that God does in his people today, just as there was in the early church. And God speaks in those times in powerful ways, uh, both in our churches, our communities, and in our homes, in our personal lives. And sometimes we can be overwhelmed by the glory of it all and uh, consider what Jesus has done, and it's like, wow, uh, this is just amazing. Well, then there's times where, I guess you'd call them tr transition uh, times, to the less spectacular. And as a matter of fact, sometimes to our senses, it seems that our lives are sent into the world by Jesus, and it feels lonely. It's difficult. Maybe we don't feel the presence of God with us, and the circumstances that we have to face appear very dark, difficult, and very troubling. Um, and under these circumstances, it seems that our lives are a little bit, or maybe a, a lot, um, in some kind of a vice press, where things are crowding us on all sides. In those times, as human beings, um, we, under, we ask ourselves sometimes, does God understand what's happening here, or what we're going through? Does he even care about the circumstance that I'm facing right now? And doubts begin to arise, and fears uh, wash across in front of us. And sometimes as people of God, we can become hardened to the truth of the way things are because we let our fears get the best of us or our doubts just to run amok. Today we're going to look at one of the miracles of Jesus in the book of Mark, which illustrates the fact that Jesus Christ is not only Lord when there is sunshine and when there is miracles that are so encouraging happening all around us. But Jesus Christ is the Lord who walks beside us and with us in times of uncertainty. Would you please turn in your Bibles to Mark 6? Our text today is from Mark 6, chapter, chapter 6, verses 45 and following. Starting with verse 45. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida. While he dismissed the crowd. After leaving him, them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Now, in context, we talked about this last week. At the time, Jesus Christ had just finished miraculously feeding thousands of people. It's not written down exactly how the crowds initially responded to what took place, but there is some hints as to what they, they, how they re reacted to it. Um, Jesus had taken his disciples to this place of rest across the lake after the disciples had come back from their missionary venture out into the countryside, taking the gospel out into the countryside. They came back. They, they were tired, and they went to this restful place, and Jesus... Um, when they got to this place, saw that the crowds of people had run around the lake to, to where they were. And, and the Lord Jesus had compassion on these people, even though he and his disciples were, were tired and they were in need of rest. And he taught the multitudes and he miraculously fed them in the process with this great miracle that we see, showing the people of the love of God 
and, and the love that he had for them and, and how he wanted to meet them where they were and meet their needs. And, and the people did respond to this. Uh, the crowds, um, they were excited, no doubt. I mean, if you were there and you saw Jesus Christ um, breaking this bread and, and, and what was five loaves of bread and two fish fed thousands and thousands upon thousands of people, you can imagine the excitement that would be in this crowd. How excited they were to see that Jesus met their need and that their bellies were filled when they were hungry. And more than that, their spirits sensed that he, was, he wasn't just a normal person. This, this is, they were thinking, this is the Messiah, the promised Messiah. But you see, their idea of the Messiah, and I've mentioned this before, was different than what Christ had in mind here. I'm sure those crowds of people were ready. They were ready to crown him as king. And they're thinking to themselves, yeah, the Romans, those oppressors of our people, are finally going to get what's coming to them. This Jesus who made us bread out of nothing, this is just like the miracle through the desert when Moses led our children through the, or our ancestors through the desert and fed them miraculously from the manna. This same Jesus is going to take control and he is going to kick butt on Rome. I'm sure that's what a lot of them were thinking. They were living in tyranny and they were looking forward to being released from their tyranny. John 6, a parallel text to what we're looking at here in Mark John 6, 14 and 15 gives us a hint of this, saying, after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. So we see here Jesus had the full opportunity to take this and run with it. He could have, he could have taken the military uh, control and, and risen up as a great military leader to trounce the Romans here, but he didn't. He didn't. This is why Jesus um, did what he did with the disciples, you see. It wasn't his plan for this to happen. Jesus was interested in a spiritual reality that a lot of the people in this crowd along the lake didn't understand. And Jesus quickly sent his disciples offshore into the boat again. Well, he dismissed the crowds himself. He, he, he said, you guys get in the boat. I'll meet you on the other side. Get going. And they're questioning. I'm sure they're questioning what's happening here. Why, after this wonderful miracle with these thousands of people acknowledging Jesus and the power that is in his, in his person, why would he just want us to leave? We just got here. Isn't this the time where we have this big rally and we stay put and we dig in and, and the kingdom of God is coming? They're, they're think, um, the disciples, are, I'm sure they're thinking this, but they obeyed the Lord. Jesus compelled them to go back out into the lake. And then Jesus dismissed the crowds and says, it's time for you guys to go home now. And he went by himself, and he climbed a mountain to get away from the crowds where he pursued the rest and communion with the Father that he needed at this time. Now, in Luke chapter 5, 16, we're, we're told this. We're told that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. What an example for us to follow here. Now, the disciples at this time didn't realize, and we're looking at this now from a distance, and we're looking at the pieces coming together here, and, and we, can, we can grasp it. Those disciples at the time, they didn't know what was happening. They were confused, actually. But what an example for us to follow. Theologically speaking, um, there's at least three reasons why Jesus Christ prayed. Jesus prayed as an example to his followers. And we see this through the gospel accounts. But in this particular circumstance, because the disciples had been put out into the sea already, they left in their boat, the prayer happened 
after they had left the shore. So it, it's not really exa an example that he was trying to set for them. Well, it is to us, but at that particular time, it, wasn't, it didn't appear to be that. Maybe he told them that he was going to pray. Maybe he did. We don't know. It doesn't say that exactly. But Jesus ordered his disciples to depart the, uh, in the boat and sent the crowds away before he ascended this mountain to pray. Well, secondly, Jesus, um, theologically speaking, I, I think Jesus, being the Son of God, he had two natures, right? We know the Bible teaches us very clearly throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament prophecies that Jesus Christ was, in fact, the living God in the flesh. He's not just... Um, uh, a, sub, a created being or a, a subservient person to Almighty God. He and the Father are one. That's what it says. But he submitted to the Father's authority yet because of the way that everything was set in place. But, but Jesus had two natures. He had his human nature, which was without sin, by the way. He was born of a virgin for that reason. He was without sin, but he was fully human, just like you and I. And he was fully God as well. And when Jesus went out to pray, I, I think the scriptures teach us that from his human nature came the recognition of his fleshly frailty in, this, in the body that he was in. He was, he was frail. He knew that. And he knew that his physical body had limitations and, and that he had the desire to derive strength from from the divine, and in the same manner that we see that we need strength inside of us and refreshment from God as well in our fleshly being. Prayer is refreshing. And yes, it's, it can be laboring, but if you pray, there's times of refreshing on the other side of that. God made us this way. He made us to commune with him and, and to come to him with our requests. Now, you, you might be saying, well, Jesus, I mean, Pastor, you're, you're kind of confusing me here. But I think if you look at the Scripture as far as, um, let's say, for example, in the Garden of Gethsemane, right before Jesus was crucified, he went into the Garden to pray. And what did he pray? He prayed, Lord, he knew what was going to happen to him, and, and he was weighted down in his physical being with what was going to happen. He says, if it's possible, could this cup pass from me? <laughs> if it's possible. He's praying to the Father. His human flesh understands what's going to happen here. He knows. He's sweating as if great drops of blood were falling from him. And he knew that there was a cross to bear. And he said, Father, if it be possible for this cup to pass from me, <laughs> please, I know what's coming <laughs> My flesh knows that it's going to be extremely painful. I know that it's going to be painful to be the sin bearer for the world. He knew this. But what was his answer in this case? He says, but, but Lord, God, his flesh is crying out, not my will, not my flesh's will, but thine be done. See? So there, there's that. Jesus connected there with the Father. And I think... Thirdly, the nature of the Trinity allows for communication between its members as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are one God, three separate persons. There is this communication. They're all on the same page. You know, it's not like Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit are going to be going in different directions. They're completely unified in the way that they approach everything. But they are one. They are one God, the persons of the Trinity or one God. So there's that. So I just wanted to mention that about prayer. Why did Jesus need to go and pray? Why did he feel that he needed to go and pray? These reasons, right? He, is, he understood the frailty of his flesh. He wanted to commune with God and he wanted to set a good example to his followers as to how they should live out their lives when he went away, when he went and ascended and sat at the right hand of the Father. So here he is, Jesus went alone 
And he prayed. And we continue reading from verse 47 of her text. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on the land. He saw his disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Now Jesus Christ knew before he sent his disciples out into the Sea of Galilee that while he was resting and praying to the Father that they were not going to, at that time, be in a state of rest. That they were not going to encounter the same peace and solitude that he was partaking in. As a matter of fact, Jesus had another lesson in mind to teach his disciples to reinforce his teaching with them. He had something else in mind. And, and he knew what was going to happen before it happened. And you can imagine how it all started, right? Here's the disciples. They're a little bit confused. They're like, huh, this is like... They're preparing probably for uh, this great ushering in of the kingdom of God. And, and the scriptures teach us as well that they totally didn't totally understand what Jesus was up to at this point in the ministry of Christ. They didn't really understand it. So they're, they're confused. You want us to go back out into the lake we just got here? Look at all these people. Like you fed them. Let's have this manifest. Manifest, right? Festival with manna. Jesus, you can produce bread. Why just stop at one meal? Why not do what our ancestors had with manna every day? We could listen to your teaching on the hillside. Right? And, and, and just have this fresh manna and, 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 and the fish and the provisions from you and we could just bask in this. And then we could get together and we could rise up and you could take your rightful place and kick butt on Caesar. Right? You can imagine. That's, wouldn't that be the normal reaction if you were a disciple of Christ and you didn't see the big picture? I think so. They thought, uh, I'm sure the, the, uh, the, the, the journey started off all jovial. They're kind of confused about being sent out in the lake, but they're like, hey, did you see that? Man, oh, you know, I broke this bread off and passed it to the, to the guy next to me, and all of a sudden, he has the same amount of bread that I, that I, that I had when I gave it to him, and he broke it off. And can you imagine the excitement within them? They're talking about this. Like, they're not just going to go out there in solitude you know, and just be silent. They're thinking about what they just experienced with the loaves and the fishes miracle. The, the people were ready to crown him king, and, and they knew he was king, and they were ready to come on board with him and support this great military venture. They were honored to be at the table with the, the master, and that he had called them, and that they were going to be part of this important thing. Yes! I'm sure they weren't sure exactly how they'd fit into it, but he knew, they knew that Jesus was with them on that. But the Lord didn't have that in mind for them. As a matter of fact, he had in mind for them to face another storm. If you remember uh, before they went to, the, to the, the shore where the miracle of the 5,000 took, they had come across the lake and there was a storm, right? There was a huge storm that came their way. They thought they were all going to drown. And Jesus said, peace be still. Boom, it was still. But this time, Jesus wasn't in the boat with them. The chattering would have likely started out light and cheery, but as the winds began to blow, and as they began to row, the winds were against them. The winds were blowing them away from their destination in that area, geographically. Um, the Sea of Galilee is at the, uh, at the outflow of the Jordan River. The Jordan River flows from Mount Hermon, which is about 4,000 feet, I guess you would, if you put it in feet, about 4,000 feet in elevation, and the, the Jordan flowed from Mount Hermon down through the, the Jordan Valley down to the, down to the Sea of Galilee on the north end, and the Sea of Galilee is about 700 uh, feet below sea level, actually, so it's dropping, you know, 4,700 feet down, and this lake is subject to great gusts of wind because of its topography and the, and the surrounding area. It, there is times when the wind just howls through there and, and, and storms suddenly come up on this lake. 
it's not a huge sea or anything, but it is nine miles wide, and, and, and there's substantial weather that comes onto that lake at times. And here they were. Jesus sent them out there, and all of a sudden, oh, here we are in the middle of a storm again. It's blowing, and it's howling, and maybe it's raining. It doesn't say about the rain, but the wind is beating against them, and they're getting blown off course, and they're getting blown out of the lake. They're straining, and they're straining, and they're straining, and here's Jesus up on the mountain praying. Did he not care? Was he not aware? Jesus was very much aware. Jesus sent them out into the storm on purpose. They were wondering where God was in all of this because human beings, I mean, some God can do miraculous things in our lives. He can do awesome things in our lives. And then what starts off, uh, off as awesome and how soon we forget when the storms of life come upon us and when the gale begins to blow before you know it. We're not looking at God anymore, but we're wondering what in the world is going on. The gale force winds buffeted the ship, blew them off, blew them off course. They're straining at the oars, not making headway. Why did Jesus send us into this all alone? He was with us last time. We could just say, hey, master. And he could deal with it. That they couldn't see him now. They couldn't see him anywhere in sight. Was God abandoning them? But Jesus was watching over them even though they didn't realize it. Each new experience of testing in life demands of us more faith and courage. Isn't that what it seems? Are you in a storm right now in your life? You may be thinking to yourself, Lord, what did I do to deserve this? It, you know, sometimes we have to consider this. Maybe you've done nothing wrong. Maybe you've done nothing wrong to deserve this. It's possible that you're being completely obedient to God and still finding yourself in the middle of a fierce storm in your life. Bad things happen. They happen all the time. And sometimes they happen even though you've done nothing wrong. And sometimes they happen. They happen simply so that God can draw near. The disciples, had, they were at that shore with that miracle, and now they're being sent over. There's no explanation. Jesus didn't explain it to them. He didn't explain it to them before they left the shore. Like, you're going to encounter a storm, people. He didn't explain that. He just said, I want you to go to the other side and cast out from the shore. For the disciples, this was a lesson in faith. They had to place their trust in the words of Jesus. Like the first disciples, we here, right now, in this congregation, maybe you're listening online, we have witnessed the glory of God as he has miraculously fed us, miraculously taken care of us. And all of a sudden, the tables turn. We get distracted from what God has done. And rather than being thankful, we begin to grumble. We begin to complain. We begin, begin to get afraid of what's happening. As if somehow God has abandoned us. But we forget God has not abandoned us. If you're in the middle of a storm right now, I want you to know this. God has not abandoned you. He has not abandoned you. He is watching over you. He loves you. And he has a plan for what you're going through in your life right now. The truth is that when we're in the midst of the stormy world and sometimes these tempests of trials blow violently upon us without warning and we're toiling and struggling to stay afloat just to make it through, it seems like we're going to sink at any moment. And it's in these times of difficulty that we come to the end of ourselves and we realize that 
We have so very little control over the outcomes. When you're on the sea of life and when a storm blows, you realize it doesn't matter. These guys that were out in the boat, a lot of them were professional fishermen. They were mariners. They were familiar with how to deal with something. And here they were in something they knew very well in navigating through their own lives and what they knew very well, and here they were out of control. They had no control. They were trying their best, and they had no control. When a storm hits you, sometimes you feel like you're out of control, and there's no control. And you know what? In you, there is no control, but there is one who has the control. There is one who understands. In our humanness, we can begin to question what we believe, can't we? Have you ever had that? If you're in the middle of a storm, sometimes you question. Is what I believe really real? Is, is what I really, is this real? Is God really with us? Is, he said he'll never leave us or forsake us. It sure feels like I'm forsaken right now. Jesus, are you there? Are you there, Jesus? Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, help us. Help us, Lord. We're drowning. We're going to go down. And here we have it. This is part of what Jesus is trying to teach him. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass them. But when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost, and they cried out because they saw him. They all saw him and were terrified. And this brings us to the second point, the significance of this miracle. When Jesus approaches us and comes to his children in the midst of the storm, It reminds us of a prophecy written in the Word of God to Israel through Isaiah, Isaiah 43, 1 and 2. Israel had received this prophecy, and it, this reminds us of this. But now this is what the Lord says, He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. My friends, today it's significant that the storms these disciples faced were two in succession, one after the other. Boom, a storm followed by a miraculous event followed by a storm. Both times, the disciples were terrified of the raging elements that were beyond their control. You see, the second miracle, this miracle that we're seeing here, that we're talking about here, the Lord may not come at the time that we think he should come because he knows exactly when we need him the most. Jesus waited until the boat was as far from the land as possible, it seems, when all hope had been lost. Jesus saw that they were struggling, and he waited and waited and waited until the middle of the night. They'd been straining on these oars and being tested by the howling wind. I imagine they were exhausted. They were already tired to start this out. In essence, Jesus was testing the disciples' faith, and this meant removing every human prop. And why did Jesus walk out to them on the water? He could have done this miracle a different way. Have you considered that? God's fully capable of teleporting himself. He could have just like, boom, there's Jesus sitting in the boat. Whew, we didn't see that. He could have done that. After all, Philip and the Ethiopian, right? Remember? God took Philip and put him in Samaria after the Ethiopian man was shared the gospel with the Ethiopian man. He accepted Jesus and was baptized, and God took Philip and went, 
back into Samaria he'd go. He could have done that. Jesus could have just been, boom, in the boat. Why did Jesus walk to them on the water? He wanted them to see that Jesus Christ is Lord over the storms of our life. And the storm and the danger consisted of the waves. And those waves were the, the, the thing that was threatening the ship. And Jesus walked on top of the circumstance. He is Lord over the waves. He is Lord over the storm. There is nothing that is happening in your life right now that Jesus does not understand and that he is not with you. On. You may feel like it's out of control, but he understands and he's with you. We will face storms, that is for sure. Immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. And then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. They were completely amazed. And what does the scripture say here? For they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. They had lost hope because they weren't looking at Jesus. The storm distracted them. If they'd been walking by faith, they would have instantly known Jesus when he was walking across. What did they see? If they'd been walking by faith, they would have recognized the Lord coming to them. What did they see? They were terrified. They thought it was a ghost. They thought what was happening was a result of the devil and he was coming to finish them off. It was an evil thing. They didn't realize that it was Jesus walking beside them because they couldn't conceive in their mind that God would actually allow such a storm to buffet them. But Jesus was teaching them something about who he was and how in life they needed him. Maybe the devil was the source of the storm. I believe that's possible. Storms will come and sometimes they'll be bad. They have the potential to rob us of hope and send us into a tailspin of despair. Jesus said, take courage. The enemy is not in control, you guys. Take courage. It is I, the great I am, the one who was before, who is, and who will always be Lord over all. Jesus, the one we serve, is Lord over everything, over every circumstance. It doesn't matter how bad it looks on the outside. He understands and he will work through this. Verse 51 and 52. Jesus came directly over to their boat and he climbed over the gunwale of the sinking boat. And when he did, immediately the winds died down. You know, <laughs> these disciples, they're so human. Right? They're so human. They were with Jesus. He just multiplied five loaves and two fish to feed 10,000 people. However many there were, 5,000 men and then women and children as well. So who knows how many there were, but there were thousands upon thousands. They just saw that, but they're glazed over with fear in the present circumstances they found themselves in. They forgot the sovereign power of the one who was sitting in the boat with them. And now they sat speechless before the master as the wind and the waves went away. They needed to learn. The storm came into their lives because it was the will of God. Jesus had commanded them to go in the waters alone and set sail for the other side. They encountered the storm because they were obeying him. During the strongest 
tempest. These men were not thinking through eyes of faith. They were panicking. In your storm, the temptation is to panic and to lose hope. But the lesson here is the Savior is with you. He has not abandoned you. Well, maybe some of you are thinking, well, it's a Jonah storm. Well, Jonah storms are real too. Sometimes when we run away from God and we want to run away from the plan that he has for us to do something in his kingdom and we run away, God sends a storm. He's the author of that to turn us back to our mission. That's true. That happens. But when your heart is wanting to serve the Lord and you're wanting to do his will and you're saying, Jesus, take my life and let it be for you, and a storm comes. It may be the enemy trying to discourage you or set, get you off course, and God permits that to happen. Remember Job? Sometimes there's, there's Job storms. God allows things to happen so that we place our trust in him and that we let go of the bottom. Most Christians have different ideas about the storms in their life, and some Christians, unfortunately, I shouldn't say unfortunately, sadly, that's a better word for it, have believed myths about storms. There's so much teaching out there that suggests that obedience to God promotes smooth sailing. They conclude, if I'm in a storm, it must be a Jonah storm. It's a result of sin. There's a story in the book of John 9, 1 to 3, where the disciples were with Jesus and they came across this man who was suffering from a physical ailment, blind from birth. The disciples seemed to think it was a result of some sin that he or his parents had committed. So they said, as he went along, he saw a blind man from birth. John 9, 1 to 3. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who's sinned? this man or his parents, so that he was born blind. Neither his, man, his parents, neither this man or his parents sinned, said Jesus. This happened so that the work of God might be displayed in him. Did you happen to understand the, the ramifications behind that that I just said? This happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. You may be going through a storm in your life because God wants to work in and through your circumstance to reveal his glory in a way that you don't understand right now while you're in the middle of it, but in the other side, it's going to be clear. It may not be until eternity where it's clear. But God has purposes for things that we go through that we might not understand. We need to trust the Lord, have faith in him. This is why this story is written to us, because we can trust God because he's trustworthy. Jesus said he would never leave us or forsake us. John 16, Jesus said, I have told you these things. Now Jesus was telling him, telling his disciples in context with what I'm just going to read to you, that he was going to go away and he was going to leave them here, but he wasn't going to leave them abandoned without another comforter. He was going to send them the Holy Spirit to walk with them. See, Jesus sent his disciples, but he was with them. God, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father, but he hasn't left us like orphans. He's given us another comforter, someone that walks beside us, someone that is within us. The Spirit of God lives within His people. He is as close as the mention of His name. He is not far away from you. You don't have to be thinking like the world does. See, the world has no hope because they don't believe. And because they don't believe, they don't have relationship with God. And the utter darkness of their circumstance pummels them. And people give up. People give up, and it's so sad. We, as Christians, you are not alone. The Lord walks with you. He is in you. The spirit of the living God has been given to you so that you are not an orphan in your circumstance. And as a matter of fact, Jesus wants us to let go of the bottom and trust him and place our faith in him 
and walk in such a way that is pleasing to him. Even when there's tyranny, even when there is pressure from all sides, he wants us to walk in such a way that we have faith that he is taking care of everything. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to fight. We can be at peace and rest and let go and say, Lord, I know that you're with me. Would you get in the boat? And he's there. He's there. John 16, 33. Jesus explains this. He says, I've told you these things that in, so that in me you may have peace. Did you know that God wants you to have peace in the midst of the storm? He's given the provisions in his person. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You can have peace in the midst of anything. They can take away your life. The apostles were all martyred and they had peace in Christ because they knew who their master was. Doesn't matter what your hardship is or where it comes from, whether it's from someone else or whether it's just the circumstances of life. Like Job, who had boils all over his body. <laughs> I am with you. In this world, you have troubles. Who here has escaped trouble? Have you had trouble? The last two years of our lives have been filled with trouble. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Take heart. I have overcome the world. That's the word of the Lord to us today. Job 14.1 says, Man who is born of woman is short-lived and full of turmoil. And that's true. But Jesus walks with us. And he's going to take us to the other side. The disciples encountered this too. Right? We've been given a life to live. It's important to understand That sometimes the storms that surround us and that but buffet us are right in the center of God's will. Jesus is with us. There's going to be 5,000 type scenarios where God's going to miraculously do something in your life or through you. And there's going to be times where you just have to trust the Lord. You have to grab a hold of the truth that the Messiah is with you. And it doesn't matter how dark it goes. He's with you. Because just like that, he crawls over the gunnel and sits next to you and goes, it's time to get going. The, the waves go away. The storm's clear. And we find ourselves on the other side, on the next step of the mission that he has for us. Everybody's got a mission. Encouragement to you. Jesus got in the boat. Everything went calm. Verses 53 to 56, and we'll close with that. When they crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there as soon as they got out of the boat. People recognized Jesus. They ran throughout the whole region and carried the sick on mats wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns, or countrysides, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them even touch the edge of his cloak, and all who touched him were healed. You and I carry a message of salvation, healing, and deliverance to a world that is sick, needs God's touch, and they need to be delivered from both themselves and the chains of the enemy that wrap around them. We are in his ambassadors, and we proclaim the gospel with the way we live and the way we speak, as though God speaks through us. He is. The Spirit of the Lord has called us to participate with him in the feeding of the multitudes. Jesus, the bread of life, is what the world needs to satisfy their spiritual hunger. That's what the, the loaves and fishes was about that he was showing his people that there is more than enough resident in Christ to feed the spiritually starved, to bring life, the bread of life, to them. And he uses us to distribute it. Don't undersell God in the midst of your troubles, in the midst of your sorrows, in the midst of your storm. Jesus has the bread of life. He wants you to trust him because he wants you to be a distributor. 
He wants you to share the goodness with the other starving beggars out there that need the bread of life just as much as you do because the people out there that Jesus sees, he loves them. And he wants them to know him. And he wants them to live with him and, and have everlasting life in him. And this morning, we're going to enter a time of communion to close. You see, Jesus is the bread of life. He's the Passover lamb, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And if we, if we allow his work to be done in us, though our sins be as red as scarlet, they shall be washed as white as snow. Though the death that comes from sin that has clung on to every human being since, since the time of Adam and Eve, we can be washed clean and be given the bread of life that brings us to life. The broken body of the Lord was brought to us for us to partake in it. And you know, there's been misunderstandings about what this meant over the centuries. Some people even thought that Christians were crazy because they were talking about cannibalism. It's not about cannibalism. It's about taking Jesus Christ as your Savior and having the spiritual bread that was given to you by his broken body, by the sacrificial offering on the cross, and his blood that was shed for you on Calvary. When that happened, he became the Passover lamb. The wrath of God passes over whoever has the, lamb of, the blood of the lamb over the doorposts of their life. The bread of life was given to bring life. The blood was given to cleanse and to wash white. This is the beauty of the sacrifice of Jesus. And this is what Jesus was trying to explain to his disciples through all of these things. Do you see it? Do you understand the connection between the loaves and the fish miracle? And the doubts of the disciples and what they had to go through in their lives and the provision of God and the fact that he is in control and that he is the author of life and that by his stripes we can have spiritual healing that the masses can be healed. The broken body of the Lord makes a way for us. That's what it is. And communion is all about remembering the work of Christ, the person of Christ being God in the flesh, the work of Christ being the Passover lamb who shed his blood, who allowed his body to be broken for us. So that when we gather together as Christians, as believers in Jesus, we celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ is the reason why we live, move, and have our being. He is the reason why we don't give up in the storm. He takes us to the other side, and he'll take us through this life, and everlasting life is the result. For the Son of God did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that is the hope of the church. And when we come to the communion table, we remember the work of Jesus because it has been finished. It is finished. When we place our trust in the Master, we can be thankful that he's going to take us through to the other side.